John Locke's An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, published in 1690, might be called the Empiricist Manifesto. It opens with a long attack on the rationalist position that many ideas are innate, present in the mind from birth. Locke compares the mind at birth to a tabula rasa, a blank tablet. Let us suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? Whence comes it by that vast door which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted with almost endless variety? Whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer in one word, from experience. In that, all our knowledge is founded. In proposing that information about the world can come into the mind only through sense perceptions, Locke distanced the mind from the external world. Locke starts from the idea that uh, when we represent the world, what we do is we have a proper object of perception that's nearer to us than, say, uh, the hand we look at, and that is our mental image of the hand. Once he's done that, he sets up a gap between the image of the hand and the real hand. And it becomes very difficult for him to bridge that gap and to claim that what he knows about the hand as perceived, the mental image, is really there in the hand as it is. The next major empiricist, George Barclay, would make the gap between the external world and our mental images of it central to his philosophy. Barclay studied the philosophy of Locke at Trinity College, Dublin, became excited with it, uh, but he felt that Lockean philosophy posed a threat uh, to religion. Barclay felt that uh, if you admitted the existence of material substance existing over, over and above minds, uh, then that led to skepticism and also to atheism. Barclay's solution, therefore, was to say that uh, bodies are simply ideas or collection of ideas. By sight, I have the ideas of light and colors. By touch, I perceive hard and soft, heat and cold, motion and resistance. Smelling furnishes me with odors, the palate with tastes, the hearing conveys sounds. And as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name, and so to be reputed as one thing, signified by the name apple. Other collections of ideas constitute a stone, a tree, a book, and the like. The, the book consists in nothing over and above a collection of ideas in my mind. There is no such thing as material substance where that, where that is supposed to be something that does exist independently of human minds. Like Locke, Barclay did not press the question of whether we can know if our sense perceptions are backed up by anything outside the mind. His way around the problem was to argue that all the collections of ideas that we loosely call things do in fact exist in the mind of God. The third major empiricist, David Hume, would not find or seek refuge in religion. Locke had attacked the rationalist notion of innate ideas. Hume would attack the core of rationalism, the belief that reason has remarkable powers. The rationalists maintained that reason, by itself, could provide us with knowledge of what the world is like. But for Hume, the mind, without experience, can know nothing about the physical world. Consider the motion of billiard balls on a table. They seem to move in perfect geometric patterns. The momentum and angle of impact seem to transfer from one ball to the next. 
a rationalist would hold that reason can analyze how billiard balls will move a priori without prior experience. Hume disagrees. We fancy that, were we brought on a sudden into this world, we could at first have inferred that one billiard ball would communicate motion to another upon impulse, and that we needed not to have waited for the event in order to pronounce with certainty concerning it. But what if we had never seen billiards? Would we know what to predict? The mind can never possibly find the effect in the supposed cause by the most accurate scrutiny and examination. For the effect is totally different from the cause and consequently can never be discovered in it. Motion in the second billiard ball is a quite distinct event from motion in the first. Suppose then that you have never seen a billiard ball. Your mind is a blank tablet. Are not any number of possibilities equally conceivable? May not both these balls remain at absolute rest? May not the first ball return in a straight line? Or leap off the second in any line or direction? All these suppositions are consistent and conceivable. Why should we then give the preference to one which is no more consistent or conceivable than the rest? All our reasonings a priori will never be able to show us any foundation for this preference. In vain, therefore, should we pretend to determine any single event or infer any cause or effect without the assistance of observation and experience?